G'day and welcome to the Car Expert Podcast. I'm Sean, your host, and today we are doing a massive Tokyo Motor Show special. Now, before we get into it, I just have a quick uh, message for our audio listeners. If you are listening on one of the audio platforms, I strongly recommend heading over to YouTube and watching this. This is a very visually heavy episode. We're going to have, uh, we can talk about a lot of different cars, have a lot of different pictures. So yeah, if you're listening, by all means, keep listening and then duck over to YouTube and watch it again. Give us a couple extra views. We'll appreciate it. I that. thought that was a reference to the fact James is on this well, week. Well, yeah, that, that leads me right in. Into it. We've got James Wong joining us. James, Hello. how are you, mate? Good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, good. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank it's been you for a while. having me back. Yes, it has been a little bit. It's, uh, I figured uh, I wanted to be the shortest person in the room, so I brought James <laughs> along. Uh, and to help really you know, solidify that, Scott Colley is here, as, as always. How are you, mate? Look, you know how tall I am, and you put me on this seat, which is so low every week. I'm starting to think it's punishment. Well, the problem is I sit on this seat, and I can't actually... Re- if I sit on it right. properly, I can't reach. Yeah. If you're watching on YouTube, I'll put the wire <laughs> shut up now, my feet. Don't hit the ground. Don't reach. So it's a little... We need so, a shoe cap. Yes. <laughs> it's punishment for all of us. Um, if you do make seat cushions, uh, please write to us, podcast at carexpert.com.au. I would appreciate one. Uh, but let's get straight into it. It's been a huge week uh, in Tokyo this week. The Tokyo Motor Show is back, and Unlike the Munich, uh, what do they call it? The I was a, a mobility show. Mobility in, show in Munich. Munich. Um, there's actually been some really interesting cars. So we're going to get into those shortly. But first of all, uh, we're going to talk about some news that's come out of it. Toyota, you may have heard of them. Uh, they are a company who doesn't actually sell an electric vehicle in Australia, but they have some very strong thoughts on them. Uh, and they say the residual values of EVs are garbage. Basically, an overseas study found that uh, battery electric vehicles lost about 51% of their value over three years, as opposed to internal combustion vehicles, which lost about 37%. So, guys, uh, I'll open this straight up to the floor. Who wants to start the discussion on this one? Look. I think it's interesting that Toyota is targeting this because at this stage, it's not a problem for that brand in Australia, given they don't sell the BZ4X here. But also, one of the big challenges with electric cars and getting them more widespread is, although you can sell plenty of new ones, a huge part of the car market in Australia and around the world is used. And there are no used electric cars out there at the moment, and the ones that are there are still very expensive. So I know Toyota's pitching this as bad news, and maybe it is if you are a Polestar or a Tesla or someone trying to build your brand in Australia. But if you're a punter looking for a used electric car to run around town in, this is awesome news, because you can get an 80 or a $60,000 car for half the price after three years with a battery that still works well and still fairly up-to-date technology. I think that's great in theory. We're not actually seeing that reduction in price yet because the used car market is still quite high. But one of the things that uh, I think has been cited is that Consumers are a bit uh, concerned about the longevity of battery life. And I know that we as a, as a species have sort of been trained to not trust batteries after a couple of years because I don't know about you guys, I wouldn't buy an iPhone that's three years old. Uh, and I, I, I think the electric car thing's sort of a similar thing where we don't quite trust it. What do you think, Jan? Yeah, I think it's something that needs to be discussed or investigated more and communicated to people because a lot of, right now, the EV market's fairly young. Most of the cars that we buy that are electric or hybrid are, are new. And, you know, other than really looking at old Toyotas, what battery longevity looks like, we don't have a really clear picture of that. And then also, the environmental aspect is so such a big part of um, electrified vehicles, but we don't talk about the holistic cycle of you know what happens to batteries when they are discarded or how they're built and what goes into all that so we're going to talk about that a bit later in the podcast so <laughs> yeah, stick around i'm not trying to jump ahead <laughs> yeah. um but um sean hanley who made a lot of these comments he's very vocal about this stuff he goes on monologues all the time and it's quite interesting because i think because toyota doesn't have a battery electric vehicle on sale here yet i think that's why these views are so polarizing because a lot of um people who follow the industry will go like well what do you know you're not even selling them yet but i think that there are some really important considerations that toyota Toyota and Sean Hanley have brought up in some of these stories that um, people perhaps don't really consider. I think, yeah, one of the points he made was, oh, well, let's say Toyota, this, the Toyota spokesperson said, um, <laughs> as an opinion of Toyota, is that, that the EV, like fleet buyers are not really considering EVs because one of the big things is the potential financial loss uh, from that uh, residual loss. And also just downtime is a huge problem. Fleets can't afford downtime. Uh, and they can't afford maintenance issues. And the problem with electric cars is you have to take them to a dealer to be worked on. And most fleets generally have their own internal mechanics. So I guess that's kind of an issue that would hold back a lot of those buyers. And fleet buyers are a big chunk of Toyota buyers. I mean, you look at the Hilux sales in Australia and where the Ranger is generally 4x4, which are generally private buyers, a lot of Hilux sales are 4x2 models that go to mining fleets, traffic controllers, that sort of thing. So it does make sense that Toyota is thinking of those people. But I think that in a lot of these comments from Toyota, they're jumping two or three steps ahead. 
because at the moment, we're not trying to sell EVs to every single fleet in Australia. There's still plenty of petrol, diesel and hybrid options out there. And bringing in electric cars doesn't mean you have to get rid of them. You can sell them side by side. So I do think they're very reasonable concerns and they're probably more relevant to Toyota than they are to most other brands, given Toyota's overall volume and its fleet volume. But just because they don't work for a certain set of people doesn't mean they don't have a place in Australia. And I think what we're seeing with the uptake of Tesla and other electric cars is, Yes, not everyone can drive one, but for a lot of Australians who have the facilities to charge it, these cars work and they're making their lives easier by plugging in at night instead of having to stand at a petrol station. So on the flip side of all of this, uh, EV Director is a company who actually deals in electric vehicles. <laughs> yes, exclusively. Um, yes, uh, they, <laughs> they import BYDs to Australia and they sell them mostly to the Eagers or, uh, dealership network, I think. Yes, so stage. a chunk of the EV Direct business was bought by Eagers, which is one of the big dealer groups in Australia. Um, they're distributed through a few different places, Eagers being one of them, and then they're maintained through what used to be Kmart Tire and Auto. It's my car. It's now my yep. car, yeah. So they're saying that, uh, well, they're sort of disagreeing with Toyota, but they're sort of implying that they're controlling the market by saying, this is the price of the car, we won't discount the car, and you want to buy it, you buy it. Even if you're going to buy a 1,000, this is the cost. And they think that that's actually going to help control that used car market a little bit. Do you think that's actually going to work? I think it's a noble idea. I don't know that it's actually going to play out, though. And I think that's because at the moment, the electric car market is still very young, and all of these brands with fixed price models can get away with it because there is more demand than there is supply. So if you want an electric car, you can't necessarily shop around that much. You can't put people head to head. You just walk in and say, you've got one in stock, I'll take it. But that's changing really quickly. I mean, we're seeing more brands bring more electric cars down under. And as that happens, all of a sudden there is going to be competition. There's going to be cars that are an old model year sitting on dealer lots and that sort of thing. And all of a sudden these fixed prices don't necessarily work. I know the EV Direct model is a bit different, but there is going to come a point where there's competition and there's old stock and that's when discounts happen. And I'm curious on both of your thoughts on this one. Um, most used car buyers are looking at a used car because they can't afford a new car. Mm. And one of the problems with purchasing an EV is that the, uh, the, there's an infrastructure cost that comes with it. Even if you're buying a used one, you have to fit a home wall charger or have some sort of facility to be able to charge the car at home. Does that, do you think that is probably causing the, the value of the used prices to come down more than, say, an internal combustion car? Uh, I don't know if that's the case right now. I think, you know, when you look at what kind of used EVs are on the market, it's like that first generation technology, like the first generation Leaf, where even brand new, it couldn't even do 200Ks. And then now you'd barely be able to get to the shops. 80Ks or something yeah. like that. Happens. So I think that's the problem. We're looking at purely on, you know, face value, where the, what we're looking at now, when you look at BYD's products, when you look at Tesla's, a lot of them haven't been around long enough to really have a proper idea of what a three to five year um, look on the market in terms of degradation or what the, the, the vehicle's condition is like and how that how people see it because you know, a lot of people just don't know how it works. It's the same problem with plug-in hybrids, for example, because people think, oh, I can plug it in, but I don't, or you know, people just don't understand how it works. And I think consumer education is has been such a big problem in Australia because suddenly Tesla pops up and the people that are willing to research and find out how it works will figure it out whether it's worth it for them or not. Some people that I know have bought Teslas and ex or, or electric vehicles and said, I'm not sure if I can do that for the next one because I get range anxiety, or I don't have the means to charge it, or I can't be bothered installing wall box. So many factors like that where I think, you know, for me personally, I, I think that having multiple solutions is the right thing. And we're seeing that start to proliferate more and more now where, you know, in a year or so's time, there'll be lots more EVs, but there will be a lot more hybrids and plug-in hybrids as well. So that, th that, that whole thing will just be a more, you know, and be a more open discussion where people can walk in and be like, okay, I, this is what I need it for. This is the amount of mileage I do. And then, you know, it, it may not have things crash and um, peak and trough and things like that because people will be able to have choice. I think the other thing that we need to get back to talking about is the idea of fit for purpose. So when you buy a new car, you obviously have a clear goal in mind. And it's the same with a used car. Not everyone buying a used car needs it to cross the Simpson Desert needs it to do huge distances. And what we've seen with used Leafs, for example, is there are plenty of people who have bought them and have them at a holiday house as their run into the shop's car, for example. And 80 k is plenty of range for that. I'm not saying this is a practical solution for a full fleet of cars, because if there comes a point where there's a whole lot of Tesla's out there that can do 100 k well, they're not much use to anybody. But even at the moment, there are still people out there who have a use for a used electric car. And I do think in the next couple of years, we're going to get a better understanding from the big brands like Tesla, but also BYD, 
on how when cars are within their eight year battery warranty and something goes wrong, how that process looks. And then even the end of life process, what a battery's worth after eight years and maybe how it can be recycled. And whether there's an opportunity there for people to buy used electric cars and turn that into a business recycling batteries. So it's gonna look very different to what it does now, but already there are options out there that suit some used car buyers. And maybe what you do with a used car and battery changes, but there will still be a market of some kind. Well, make sure you subscribe because we are going to follow this up. Uh, in 2026, we'll come back and revisit this one. <laughs> uh, but we're going to move on. Uh, Tokyo... You'll be completely bored by then. <laughs> yes, yes. That's going to be about six <laughs> weeks, I think. Um, we're sitting here with you every week. Uh, Tokyo is a go-go. It's, uh, it's been a few years, a few rough years for the poor people of Japan uh, with the Olympics being cancelled, Tokyo Motor Show not running, a whole bunch of events that they probably would have had on just haven't come to fruition. Um, Really don't know why. It's, nothing's really yeah, happened. Nothing happened in the last yeah, couple of years. But anyway, uh, Tokyo Motor Show is back, uh, and Paul and Albors are actually there on the ground, uh, and we're going to pass over to them now. Who are going to? They're going to tell us a little bit about what's going on, guys. Take it away. Thank you, Sean. I don't know how we keep ending up <laughs> big at motor shows together. Hey, it's nice today. It is. Um, actually, before we start talking about the cars, I'm at the Nissan stand. I'm being hosted by Nissan. You're hosted by Toyota. Yeah. Um, I want to just talk about how absolutely chock-a-block this motor show is. It is the complete opposite of the Munich motor show, which yeah. looked like a year 12 assignment. Literally, and yeah. that no one wanted to go and look at. Yeah. Um, whereas this just feels like motor shows of old, where it was chock-a-block with people and big reveals. It was really all just happening. There aren't a huge amount of manufacturers here. No, it's but... quite small. There's only two main halls. Um, but it's surprising to see they're launching a lot of new cars here still. So it's actually like yeah. a proper show. Yeah. Uh, and same theme as Munich. They're all talking about Chinese brands. I don't know if you had the same discussions with your guys, but every uh, exec we spoke to talking about proliferation of Chinese brands and how they're coming into the market. Oh, look, competition is good. Well, that's what I think. So yeah. if you don't want competition, price your cars better and away you go. What? It has been different from Munich is that because I'm with Toyota, they've spent yeah. the last two days talking about how EVs don't work. <laughs> and they've got a couple of I really... I wonder why. They've got a couple of really good lines around it. For example, they say that for every EV that they make, the amount of raw material that's required in a battery, they can make 90 normal hybrids, 90, 90 or six plug-in hybrids. So for one EV or 90 hybrids, and that, therefore they're saying that hybrids are better for the environment. Yeah. Um, just out of interest, did Toyota commission that study about uh, how good their hybrids are? No, no, are? this is from their own battery production facility, so the amount of raw right. material that goes into it. Mm, yeah. Interesting, I wonder if that's skewed at all. Hey, it's, what, it's what they claim. Yeah, okay, well, look, I was excited by this thing behind us. So this is, well, they're not calling it a GTR, but this is the new GTR, and it's going to be fully electric. It's debuting solid state battery technology, and today the discussions we had with the execs, they were saying that this or the solid state battery tech will go into full production by 2028. 2028? Yeah, and they reckon they'll have the first batch rolling out in the next few years as test cars. Right, because I've got to say that wow. does not look production ready. Yeah, exactly. I think it's still, still probably a little bit of time away. I'm going to go do a little walk around with that as well, because there are some elements on that that are kind of production hints. Okay. Uh, but it is interesting as well that Tamura-san, who is the, I guess, the GTR guy, the, the Nismo guy that was behind Zed as well, He's not involved in this. And he actually said ages ago when I interviewed him that he doesn't want to be involved in any electrified GTR. And he, he, he told us a lot of things that we can't repeat on camera. <laughs> um, Legend of a guy though. Yeah, um, yeah. Now, tell us about Toyota. What have they got going on? They've got a whole bunch of cars going on there. They've got an electric ute. They've got an electric Land Cruiser. Um, and as Toyota Australia has confirmed that while we won't get the electric ute because it's built for the Asian market, yep. um, we will, if they put it into production, get the electric Land Cruiser. And it oh, looks... Wow. Amazing. It actually looks it really, really nice. Yeah. Uh, there's no details whatsoever uh, at the moment, but to be honest, it looks very production ready. And they said they're going to have two more models after the B4ZX that comes next year before 2026. Will they actually be good or will they just continue with the theme of average? One of them uh, may be the electric Land Cruiser. Right. Okay. Yes, potentially. Yeah, potentially. look, I, I have a lot of issues with something like that because the second you try and I think tow you have a lot with of it, issues in general. The second you try and tow with it or go off road or do anything that an internal combustion version of that vehicle can do, the, the reality behind them kind of falls apart. So I am hoping they've thought about that and are going to actually well, do I, something with I it. Well, I was off roading with a B4ZX yesterday, yeah. which was not something off -roading. I. Off roading. I know, but we was did. It, a it was road? No, it was a proper off road course. It's, it's wow. called Land Cruiser Park in Tokyo. Mm. No, I'm serious. It was hardcore and it was surprising. I've never off roaded in an EV and it was pretty good. The downhill descent looked like it was dying, but other than that, it was really good. Hardcore. 
show you hard. It court. was. Uh, other stuff that's going on over here at Nissan. Uh, they've got their other uh, concept cars on display. There were four that they'd revealed in the lead up to the show. Um, they look sort of pretty cool as well. But I think just the vibe of this show. It's amazing. Is awesome. It, it feels amazing. like an old motor show. So yeah. I hope um, it's the beginning of the return. Yes, my fingers and toes are crossed. So, uh, yeah, let us know in the comments. Shoot us an email. Uh, what have been your highlights of the show? There's a new Triton over there. There's a couple of people hanging around that at the moment. Looking forward to finally driving that. Uh, but, yeah, let us know highlights of your show. Oh, actually, it is worth pointing out, Honda. Ah. Yes, they make cars, but there is also a jet over there. <laughs> yes, the, well, the, the, the Prelude is here, the new yes. what, whatever two-door sports car yes. thing that I just it's casually walked It's so exciting that I did the yes. exact same thing. I was like, yep. is that a Honda? Oh, yeah, it is a Honda. It looks yep. like an 86. Yeah, anyway, let's go to the jet. <laughs> um, but yeah, they literally have a jet on their stand, which I think is unreal. It is just so cool. Yeah, but if you um, can't make uh, really exciting cars, a jet is always an yep. option. But actually, the Prelude looks pretty cool. It does, but just a bit generic, <laughs> in my opinion. Anyway, uh, back to you guys, back at the studio. Thanks guys, uh, looks like you're having a lot of fun over there. Don't have too much sake, you gotta come back and do some real work. Um, so, look, really cool cars coming out of there. Uh, shortly we're gonna play a little game of Hot or Not like we did with Munich, Love it. but uh, first of all, I wanna just talk about a couple of things that Paul and Albers mentioned there, namely, uh, back to Toyota again. Uh, Toyota are claiming that it takes, uh, they could make 90 Priuses for essentially the battery material of one electric car. Yeah. Like, what, really, is that? Just a bold claim. Well, I think one of the key parts of how Toyota has kept its electric hybrid cars so affordable is the batteries. Up until very recently, they used quite basic, what are called nickel metal hydride batteries. And even now, the RAV4 hybrid has a lithium ion battery in it that has, call it a hundredth the capacity of the battery in a big car like a Tesla Model S, which obviously makes it much cheaper to make. So the maths on that kind of stacks up in my head, but that also then does exclude the carbon benefits of charging a big battery on renewable energy throughout its life, rather than filling it up with 91 unleaded and all the other stuff that comes with that. So it's definitely an interesting look at one part of the supply chain, but I don't know that it's a holistic answer to, to carbon, which is what Toyota has said is the enemy consistently. And the, the bitter irony of all of this is the amount of electric cars that Toyota unveiled. <laughs> the yeah. show, <laughs> which we'll run through <laughs> shortly. Um, so look, uh, it's interesting, yeah. Toyota, Toyota is playing a bit of a funny buggers there, um, but there's some really other, uh, some other really cool cars. Uh, Honda, uh, James, I'm sure you're a big fan of this. It was the uh, Prelude concept that yeah. they've, they've teased? Yeah, it was. A, it was a really big surprise to see that get revealed, and the fact that it looks so close to production as well, because a lot of Hondas. Uh, EV concepts, I don't even mm. know what the name, they normally have like an E-something in their name, whereas this one had like a normal name and it looks like a normal car and it's this weird design mishmash of a few different models that we've seen in the past from, you know, European and Japanese brands and stuff and I guess maybe they're starting to lean on their legacy nameplates and things like yeah. that, which is cool. I, li I like a, a retro mod sort of thing where you take an old name or design and sort of revi revitalise it for the modern age and um, it's an exciting thing to see, yeah. They also did something really unusual. Usually with concept, it's all about expectation management, but the boss of Honda came out and said, keep your expectations high for this model, which is a fantastic quote. I love the confidence. It's not something that, um but not, not a thing we've had with Honda for a few years. <laughs> no, exactly. A bit, of a, a bit of a dry spell for them. It's, but, a, um, it's yeah. a different approach to Toyota, to um, public criticism, isn't it? Like Toyota's saying, well, this is what, why we haven't done it. And Honda's like, yeah, we're just going to do something really great next. Yeah. <laughs> it, I think it's interesting. After the, the Munich uh, or the IA Mobility, um, we were like, well, the future's electric, but it's kind of dull. Boring. I think yeah. Tokyo is really showing a different side to the whole, the whole uh, EV future, I guess. I think Japanese brands have had a pretty rough trot. Um, I know that COVID's hit a lot of them very hard. And if we go back to the start of the 2010s between GFC and tsunamis and earthquakes in Japan that hit their production facilities, Honda was really hit by that. It's been pretty tough for them. So it does feel like they kind of have their mojo back. Toyota has a new design direction. Honda's trying some cool stuff. Nissan's just decided that it's all straight lines. But these brands, I think, are using electric power as the opportunity for a rebirth and to really find their feet again after the crazy 80s and 90s bubble cars. And I love that. I just think it's going to be fantastic when there's more variety on the road. 
Well, let's get into our game of hot or not because there is a lot of variety <laughs> going on here. Uh, we're going to start with probably what I guess, well, I mean, I wasn't there, but it sounds like it was the absolute showstopper, the Nissan Hyperforce, which is essentially the next GTR, the replacement GTR. It's going to be a solid state battery, 1,000 kilowatts, um, not a fire breathing monster, but I imagine there'll be some lightning coming out <laughs> the back of it. Yeah. Um, the carbon fiber highlights on it are amazing, but I'm curious, guys, hot or not? Hot. Yeah. Hot, yeah. 1,000 kilowatts, all-wheel drive, and graphics inside designed by the people from Gran Turismo. Sign Which is, me up. That's not old, uh, that's not new news yeah. with, uh, with uh, GTRs. That's been around for a while, but these ones might work a little bit better than the previous ones did. Yeah, it is funny. I've driven an R35 GTR, and a lot of the screens there are genuinely identical to what you get on Gran Turismo Sport when you're playing online. So I'm looking forward to seeing how the next gen then translates to the next Gran Turismo. It's a bit like V or something. Yeah, it exactly. Have, it does have all... I think that's the thing. It was really cool to see exciting stuff from some of these brands because like Nissan has been, and no disrespect to the stuff that they do because a lot of their cars are quite good still, but they've been very dull for a long time and their future visions have not been super exciting. To see something like this where they're like, it was very clearly a GTR, yeah, yeah. and they sort of kept the excitement by not calling it that. Yes. Even to down to like the pixelated badge up the front, which yeah. is very clearly a GTR badge, and then even the one at the back, so it's like a the R35 recreated for this like futuristic electric yeah. age. Like what a cool thing, yeah. and like the, the carbon fiber wheels and stuff was super, super cool. There was a point when Nissan said, the Duke is our exciting car. <laughs> the fact That's that they so now so do much. the Z, they're doing a new GTR, we hope based on this concept, I think they've rediscovered what exciting actually means, which can only be a good thing. Jinx is sort of exciting, isn't it? Fear of if death's you, always yeah. when you feel most alive. Oh, if I'm going to be dragged in the comments again, aren't I? Yeah, if, <laughs> if you're completely blind, it's probably great. But other than that, it's not so great. Um, if you accidentally bought a Nismo, I am sorry, seek help. Actually, really good fun to drive, but that's a different <laughs> story. Let's talk about <laughs> that later. you can't see it. Um, <laughs> but uh, something that uh, well, I think is hot, but I'll ask you guys, uh, Honda Prelude. Hot, well, hot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, it's going to be the star of Fast and Furious 27. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. Um, <laughs> uh, CGI Paul Walker driving that unquestionably. But uh, yeah, again, like James said before, really cool, right? Mm. What, are, what are your thoughts on it, Scott? Uh, I think the concept looks slightly awkward. The sort of front light treatment I don't love. It looks a little bit sort of overbitey. But I also love that Honda's actually doing it. So I'm going to give it a pass on the slightly awkward concept looks. They've got plenty of time to sort it out. Honda, make it happen, make it affordable. I'm there with you. Uh, in another classic 90s uh, Japanese fast car reborn, basically a new MR2. It's called the um, Toyota FTSE. <laughs> so I don't know, man. Toyota, look, you're gonna just to, to give you guys a heads up. There's a lot of Scrabble from Toyota. This year, so just, uh, <laughs> or just like code. I don't understand. Yeah, it's, it's like it's... trying to enter a code into like an yeah. Excel cell or something like yeah. that. Some Someone of the at names. Toyota was naming it, and their iPhone came up with, "Is this the code you want?" <laughs> yeah, from exactly. messages and they press that. Like someone's iCloud key change has <laughs> yeah, got exactly. into all the names. <laughs> yes, please choose a stronger password. <laughs> uh, but what do you think, FTSE or the new MR2? What do you think? Hot or not? Uh, I'm going to say hot, but I'm also hoping that Toyota has made this handle like an early MR2, which would mean just making it spin on the spot and they'll be littering every hedge around <laughs> industrial estates in Melbourne within seconds. So it's hot if it handles like the first MR2. Right. James? Uh, I'm sort of in the middle of it. I really like the colour. There were some angles of it that I really liked. I saw the front and I was like, it looks a little bit like an insect and I wasn't 100% sold on that. Um, let's say lukewarm. Lukewarm. All right. Well, that wasn't an option, but I guess it is now. Uh, something, look, um, if you say this is not hot, I'm going to smack you. Um, the Mazda Iconic SP, the RX-7 hot. Reborn. Yeah. Hot, hot, hot. Stunning. It's absolutely, absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. Igor's behind the camera right now and he's nodding very, yeah, very he's, ferociously. He's in full agreement. Um, I mean, like, what do you say about this car? It, it is like, it is... You know, remember when Alpha used to bring out these really cool concepts back in the 2010s and we were all like, that is what, yeah. that is what this car is. It is. But will they ever actually build it? Yeah, that's what you need to say about this car. They need to bloody build yes. it. Yes. Um, in, in saying that, Mazda has a fairly good history of taking some of these really cool concepts and um, adapting them to production. There was a couple of cool concepts that were, um, previewed the current Mazda 3 and the hatchback especially looks a lot like the original concept. Mm. Um, the the six sedan and the CX-5 were um, were fairly true to their concepts as well, 
now we just need to see more of the sports car stuff because the MX-5 has been around for a really long time. That formula doesn't really need to change. So you can imagine how that would sort of look. And we actually thought this concept was going to be an MX-5 yeah. future facing thing. But the fact that this looks like a, a modern day RX-7 and even has that they've made a point to say that it's got a rotary engine yep, in it. Yep. There's, you know, this plug-in hybrid range extended thing. That's actually my main problem with the car. I love the way it looks, the interior is stunning, but I wish Mazda would just commit to building a petrol version or an electric version. This thing they've got going on at the moment where they go, well, it's a rotary range extender and maybe that's the future. I feel like we've kind of landed on the fact now that the future is going to be electric or it's going to be hybridised in certain situations. In fairness, they said it could run on hydrogen. So it would they technically be electric. But can you imagine like sitting there at the lights and the thing's just going wow. Like, it'd be so strange. The, the problem is inevitably your wanker will just stop working. And then, but the good thing is... Yeah, <laughs> uh, but like, it, it will inevitably stop working as what happened with uh, basically every RX-8 in existence. But then you get to look at it while you wait for the tow truck. And I think that's not a bad deal. Right? I just... Uh, so depressure rising rotary engines is a real problem. The idea of hydrogen, if it becomes rapidly depressurized and what that looks like, scary. Well, it yeah, I could look at it. Depends hydrogen on Hydrogen is a very funny topic. In theory, it should be okay because it's a very light air gas. It should just evaporate into the atmosphere. But like all your hopes and dreams <laughs> as yes. your very expensive Mazda <laughs> sports car sits there, yeah. Yes, it's not, it's not called the, no. no. Give, it, give it the two point, Sorry, the two-liter engine from the MX-5, yep. make it rev to nine grand, give it a manual transmission, or make it fully electric. I don't want this halfway house stuff. Yeah. Yep. All right, let's move on. Um, the Toyota, another one, but this one is actually kind of exciting. It's the Toyota LC SE, uh, and if you are familiar with Toyota, then you'll know that LC means Land Cruiser, and this is. Uh, an electric Land Cruiser yeah. um, in every sense, I guess, but hot or not. Hot. Eh. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of yep. an electric Land Cruiser and I think that it's going to be really cool when we see very capable electric off-roaders like the G, but I also, there's no indication of when it's getting built, we don't know what it looks like inside, we don't know what capability it has, so really cool idea, but beyond that, I just, we don't know enough. Yeah. I can't see many blokes whose names end with like Acker or Azza lining up to buy it anytime soon. So, yeah, I, look, it's it's a cool idea, but I mean, given Toyota's opinion on electric vehicles this week, uh, and then that, it's like, well, well, they've said they want it in Australia though if it goes into production. So, although Australia is still not quite ready for fully electric cars, according to Toyota, in a number of cases, they want this electric Land Cruiser, which. I can see selling, but does feel like a bit of a conflict with what they've said. And it's going to look great cruising the streets of Turak, and that's probably where it's going to yeah. spend most of I think of they need life. a hybrid Land Cruiser first before <laughs> yes. they go to full electric. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, but speaking of Toyota Utes, uh, they have an electric Ute concept, which I think actually looks kind of cool, but again, I'd whether it ever happens. What do you guys think? Hot. I really like the look. Yeah, I think that, that was revealed alongside that Land Cruiser and they're both very cool looking cars. But like Scott was saying, it's very early days. The design's still very rough in the sense that it's like, you know, that slab sided thing with not too much detail. So it's very early in the design process. So how they can make that into a production car will be really interesting. And then, you know, the fact that they didn't even offer any insight into like motors, yeah. battery, capability, you know, people want to tow with these things, they need payload, all that sort of stuff. Until you really know what those things are capable of and how close they are to production, like, yes, they look cool, and if that's the game we're playing, sure, but in terms of, like, from, from a consumer's <laughs> perspective, which is what we're also meant to be doing, it's sort of like a, yeah, let's see what happens. Well, credit to Toyota for trying this because they've been making the same cars since man picked up tools in a cave. So good on them for giving it a go. Um, Sean really getting some shots in here <laughs> yeah, at Toyota. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm making the most of it while I can. Uh, another one, I guess his name's just amazing. The Toyota FT3e, which is a large luxury SUV. Hold or not. This is the BZ4X looking one, isn't it? Yeah, but it's, I think, bigger again. Yeah. Uh, the fact that it's kind of, neither of us can yeah. remember really what it is says right. enough. It was okay. Not quite lukewarm, but yep. like All right. warmer than cold. Um, <laughs> look, I don't not like yeah. it. I like this game. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll move on to, we'll move on then from Toyota. Uh, the Mitsubishi DC, which is a modern, well, I guess a 
futuristic Hot. take. Yeah, I wrote this, and you I actually got a really good story about it too. Yeah. They wanted in Australia, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's a really cool thing because the you know the Delica or the Delica, who however you say it, is um, it's an old name play that you may have seen some of the older versions running around in Australia, both as a commercial van as a as a people mover. Um, it's been off sale here for a really long time, but they're super popular in places like Japan and some parts of Southeast Asia, and um, they're looking at actually bringing in the next generation one, which going by this concept will sort of do what the Kia Carnival did and be more blurring the lines between like MPV and SUV. Or a GUV. Is yeah, that? GUV. <laughs> there you go. Um, but, you know, they're in the, the concept, which is still very out there it in some like a, way. It looks like a moon rover or it something like that. It looks like, like a moon that. rover, yeah. yeah, with its like all-terrain tyres. Like yeah, the it does come with like 33-inch muddies to go off-road. They with. didn't give an exact measurement, but there are <laughs> in large diameter tyres okay. according to the press right. release. Cool. And um, it's meant to embody Mitsubishi Motors-ness, which wasn't really explained. Yeah, but Mitsubishi's Motors-ness is just the vaguest term <laughs> on earth. But I do think there is some authenticity to this concept because the Delica is known as being a rugged people mover. There's all sorts of... They've got fantastic names like Delica Space Gear, Alpine Tour Special and that sort of thing. But they have roof tents on them, they have raised ride heights, they have proper four-wheel drive systems and they come to Australia as grey imports. So hopefully Mitsubishi can get this next one here because I can actually really see a market for it among the people who, I don't know, maybe camp on the beach in their Hilux or something like that to instead have a high-riding Delica that can go a bit off-road and has plenty of space in the back for whatever you get up to afterwards. As long as it's got a little ladder on the back to get up to the stuff on the roof, then, <laughs> then it is a Delica. The other thing I just would quickly want to say on this is that doing my research, I realised that the, the current one, which is about 15 years old now, is actually based on the same platform as the previous Outlander and then the current ASX and Eclipse Cross. And the way that they were talking about the plug-in hybrid powertrain, again, with not much detail, leads us to believe that it's going to be based probably on the new Outlander platform, have the same power train so it's sort of like you know this platform underneath and then different body on top and you can imagine we, we all like the current outlander plug-in hybrid you're running one at the moment no, sean i love it i think it's fantastic yeah so genuinely. imagine that with like a you know a boxy van off-roader aesthetic and i think that's super cool yeah ripper all right this is uh this probably wins the award for worst name uh of, for a car <laughs> all year at the very least but it's called the subaru sport motility Mobility, sorry, Subaru <laughs> Sport <laughs> Mobility Concept. That would be even worse. <laughs> it's yeah. A, yeah, Subaru Sport Mobility Concept. Um, thankfully, the name is the pretty much the only bad part about it. Yeah, I think it looks fantastic. Yeah. Subaru does weird better than most, and this is weird, but it's good weird. Yeah, James. Yeah, I agree. I think it looks really cool. Um, I'm very scared that they're going to ruin the production model though, because they've done <laughs> that with the, the WRX and the Lavorg looked amazing as concepts, yeah. and then they brought them to production. They were skinny with skinny wheels. And it was just like, where did the good yeah, stuff go? Yeah. That was so good. Yeah, look, the, I, look, I reckon this looks like something out of a Halo game, but um, you know, a cool looking thing. And, and uh, again, Subaru is a company that always plays it really safe with its designs, and it's cool to see something bold coming out of them. Um, sort of Toyota. -y. Uh, Lexus L LFZC. It's just like a Prius or something. Yeah, no. yeah, sort of that sort of thing. No, look, it actually it is quite a significant car for them because it debuts what they call giga casting. And it's the way that Tesla makes cars. It makes it easier to make large panels at scale more quickly and at lower costs. It's so, just like, you know, the, the model planes you get, you pop out each bit from the... Yeah, it's the Lexus yeah. Airfix. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it genuinely does have some relevance to production cars and how Lexus and Toyota want to do things in the future. Just wish it didn't look like it does. Yeah. Um, so the... And then following on from that, the Lexus LFZL, which is the big version of it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a yeah. not from me yeah. as well. That's no, not it looked me. like... Yeah, it just didn't look right. All right, well, we've got one last one, and we actually sort of talked about this on the podcast yeah. a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's called... <laughs> pardon the name. Uh, the Afila Prototype. <laughs> it's an interesting name, but essentially it's the Sony Honda... Yeah. ...concept thing... Um, hot, hot, what do we reckon? It, yeah. It's fine. Yep. It's a fairly generic looking electric sort of fastback yep. thing, really. Yeah, I've, the, the, the initial design study I feel like looks better than mm, this one, which I is agree. close to production. It sort of has a bit of an awkward proportion to it. But power to them for trying. Yeah. <laughs> Look, uh, so yeah. supportive of you. Yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty much the, the, the headline acts that have come out of Tokyo. Some awesome cars, some... Cars. Not so inspired cars, uh, and look, I, I do want to shout out, Albus talked about it uh, in his little yeah. um, throw over there, the uh, Honda Jet that they have on display there. 
uh, is a gorgeous piece of machinery. I don't want to get carried away. I know we're a car podcast. I'm actually starting Playnex, but next week, so tune in. Um, yeah, really, really pretty. Really, really cool. We'll probably get you from Sydney to Perth uh, in uh, a couple of hours and in great comfort and speed. So, um, yeah, shout out to Honda for showing up to a car show with a plane. That's Remember that's when bold. Honda was the company that did, I mean, they still do motorbikes, generators, fishing, equipment, etc. But they also had Asimo. The robot. The world's most yes. advanced humanoid robot is yeah. what they called Didn't it at the time. Age well. And they had the jet, the car and Asimo on stage in a motor show. I don't know how old we would have been. But I still remember that photo there, and I'm sad that Asimo. I think they still use it on some of oh, their corporate they? imagery. I think I've seen Asimo <laughs> show up a couple of times. It's not like a Japanese car company to stick with something very old, is it? They? Tried and tested. Yeah, that's, tried that's and tested. You, yes. you have to say it well, that way. I'm not allowed to say that about people or robots. <laughs> that's something entirely different. If you are interested in any of these cars, we've got a full write-up on the website. And if you're looking to purchase one of them, you can't quite yet. But we have a great way to help you purchase one of the cars available on the market currently. Now, I know there's a big delays with some cars, but we have a connection of dealers that can probably get you into one of those cars sooner than you think. It's very simple. Head to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert, and we'll take you to a page where we can help you source a car, uh, get, uh, find the car, we'll connect you to a dealer, make sure you get the right price, and we'll get you into that new car sooner. So head to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert, and if you do use it, leave a comment below. Let us know how was it, uh, any thoughts, feedback, because We'd love to know. It's very difficult for us to use it ourselves because uh, we're busy running it. So We yeah. actually have some feedback on the site now. I was actually playing around with the website, funnily enough. Is as that why of... it went down? <laughs> yeah. That explains that, yeah. yeah. just jumped in the back end, fiddled with some code, You could say something things. about Russia, but then, yeah. <laughs> nah. um, But there are some testimonials on the website and they show what cars people have actually bought and how their experience was. I know we choose what shows up there, but the feedback was really positive. So please do that for the comments here as well. Yeah, and um, if you do buy a car, also uh, submit an owner's review. We had a great one this week. Uh, it turns out we learned a new thing. Jesus is back and he drives a Chevy Silverado. Great review, um, very very cool. We get some really cool cars coming through there. Not all new cars, some of them are old. So uh, yeah, check out that. Uh, if you do buy a car, leave a comment and leave us a review because yeah, it'd be, it'd be great to hear from you. All right, we'll move on to the car that we're reviewing this week. Uh, and we're going to stick with Japan because it's our big Japanese special, I guess. Uh, it's the new Honda CRV, which is one of those cars that's been a really long time coming. I think the previous gen came out in 2011, and it really felt like it driving one. I think we actually had one in the office earlier this year, and it felt oh, kind of Flintstone yeah. at that point. Yeah, uh, but the new one is... It's a different car. It's a completely different car. It looks great. Uh, it drives really well. They've redone all the engines. Um, you don't need us here. You've just reviewed no, it perfectly. Yeah. No, no, but we do need your thoughts. It's really important. <laughs> and the interesting thing we're going to have today, we're going to have sort of two CRV reviews because mm. Scott and I drove the petrol-powered one, yeah. but James, you actually went to the launch and drove the hybrid one. Yeah. So tell us, we'll, we'll start with that because it is kind of the top tier version you can get. Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, so the, it's the first time actually that Honda's offered a hybrid CRV in Australia and this has been something that they've struggled with for a while because obviously, you know, electrification has really picked up in Australia. Honda's been a little bit behind. Not according to Toyota, but yeah. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but they have hybrids, you know. And yeah. so um, Honda need, has been working on completing a new, a refreshed portfolio under their new business model and CRV was pretty much the last one to, to get that. So this new um, CRV hybrid gets their new eHev tech. They have quite of, uh, an extensive way of explaining it. Basically, there's two electric motors, it's got a petrol engine, drives like a similar drive concept to your conventional Toyota hybrid, but it's meant to be a little bit more torquey, a little bit more fun to drive. And, um, you know, the, the previous CRV was already a fairly capable handler, like it still drove pretty well, um, but there were certain elements of it, particularly the, the tech that was mm. starting to feel it really was outdated. Really old, wasn't it? Especially the infotainment. It looked like something out of like Windows 98. It really did. <laughs> With the stars and everything. Yeah, every, yeah. <laughs> every time I ever drove one. And, you know. Honda reversing cameras also. Sorry, I know yes. I cut you off no, there. No, 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 the no, reversing camera on that old CRV, it was as if someone had like smeared something on the lens Ooh. for soft focus. Yeah. It was shocking. That was really, really frustrating trying to park. Especially on such a big car. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for me, I, um, my family had a first-generation CRV that they bought, my parents bought new in 2000. I drove it as my first car right yeah, here's through. Here's a picture of that on screen yeah. right now. There you go, yeah, see, if I've, aged. Yes. see if I've aged okay. Yeah, but, um, just... you know, we, one of the reasons that my parents never went back and bought another one was because particularly once they started moving to the tie-made ones, it was like third and fourth generation, they never quite had that same feel. And, you know, we were talking before about mm. that, you know, that heyday of the 90s for Japanese 
brands. And, you know, I've grown up with Hondas and Subarus and they just, for a little while, they weren't really feeling the same. This one feels like a real return to form. It's still made in Thailand, but it has the same look and feel as um, Honda's other products that have just been launched. So Civic, which is an excellent car, HRV is really good, ZRV is pretty good as well. And you've got that same, you know, all the same infotainment tech, all the same assistance technology, and it almost feels like a two generation jump. Like you were saying, the, yeah. old, the fact is that the last generation actually came out around 2017, but the fact you thought it was from 2011 <laughs> shows us how old <laughs> it felt. Go. Yeah, um, so the hybrid I drove. Is it the same hybrid system that's in the Civic, or is it got more powered for the bigger CRV? No, it's about the same. So it's, it's like a 135 kilowatts thereabouts. Because yeah, that Civic is. Like a, it is a, unbelievably well a, a good. Type R. It is so quick. It <laughs> yeah. handles so well. It is yeah, it's, and, and that's the thing. This really felt like a big Civic made for when you have to take three kids and their friends in the back. Um, and I really enjoy, because I drove the, the petrol first and then we did, uh, we were running out to Mornington Peninsula. So once you get off um, Peninsula Link, there's a couple of really nice roads into Red Hill and I had the, the hybrid for that stint. And like the Civic, in, if you put it in, in its sportier settings, it has like this augmented engine sound and yeah. like it shifts gears and it almost sounds like an old F1 car. And it's, it's completely ridiculous for a car like this. But the fact that, you know, combined with really, you know, keen and direct steering, a really Really, um, nicely controlled body and this drivetrain that just wanted to go because it's got like 330 newton meters from the moment you step on the pedal from that electric motor. It was a really, really fun thing to drive. And you know, I, I say to a lot of people that ask me questions about hybrids on the market, you know, Toyota's the, the leader. They make the most efficient ones. It's sort of like the easy, easy recommendation. But a few Hondas of the other are more fun. Yeah, Honda knows fun. how to have fun. I mean, look at the NSX. That thing is out of this world. Uh, that does nothing for it, me. But it's yeah. a hybrid, man. That thing goes like yeah, stink. Yeah. That's a very <laughs> Different side of the yeah, scale. Same thing. Same but thing, you know, same when you look at you look at the CRV versus the Rav4 hybrid for hybrid, mm. and you know the Rav4 quotes more power is probably quicker in a straight line if you were to line them up for a drag race. But the fact that the CRV actually makes you feel something, and you know you're willing to push it hard because a lot of Toyota hybrids, you those engines are very coarse when you start revving them out. It was just so much fun. And, and it looks great too, because yes. the, the RS, which is the top spec hybrid, like looks fantastic. Yeah, in, in that opinion. red. Yeah, it's the red with the black highlights. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful colour. Um, so moving back to the petrol side of things, which is the car that uh, Scott and I drove, which is the VTI L7, I think it was. Yeah, alphabet suit, but yeah, it is the most expensive, most luxurious seven seat version you can get. But you say most expensive, it's $53,000 drive, drive away, away yeah. which is actually yeah, really good value well in the context of the market. Um, it's, it's a little bit more subdued in the looks department, but I think it still looks really smart. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it looks subjective, but yeah, I think it looks really good. Um, it only has a 1.5 litre four pot. Uh, yeah, turbocharged turbo, engine. Which it feels a little underdone, especially if you were to load up, like if you were to load that up with people, I think you'd struggle because it's 100, what have I got here? 140 newton meter, uh, 140 kilowatts, 240 newton meters. I actually kind of disagree with you on that. And I know we talked about this before the podcast, but it's one of those engines that when you really put your foot down, it makes all sorts of noise and it's not uncomfortable or anything, but it doesn't feel like it's happy doing it. But with those Honda CVTs and the turbo engines, when you kind of give it half throttle, it actually gets along really nicely and kind of just sits in its torque band. I put my foot down away from a freeway on ramp and went, oh, this is horrible. But driving it over the course of a week, I actually kind of got to know where it was most comfortable and came away going, yeah, I could do this. I don't know that I'd want seven people on board yeah. all the time, up and down hills and stuff, but... Or a ton of towing, which is what they claim capacity yeah. is, so yeah. But I think it is perfectly adequate for most people are gonna be doing with it. And in the five seat version, which is a bit lighter and obviously can't carry seven people, I think you've got plenty of punch there. And credit to, uh, speaking of weights, um, the, the seven seat is only mm. 1,700 kilos. I don't understand how Honda's done that. I mean, everything must be made out of space age materials or something, because that is incredibly <laughs> light. It's Honda Jet underneath. It's Honda Jet, yeah. Um, um, look, again, like James was saying with the, the hybrid, it's pretty much the same interior as uh, what you get in the Civic, which, yeah. look, it, it, it's a little bit dull, I guess. Everything's sort of that same monotone, grey, blacky colour. Yeah, the Civic, you can get some more silver trim on the dash and that sort of thing. This doesn't have yeah. that. It, 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 look, it could probably benefit, but there's not much piano black. Um, it's really, it is, it's quite stylish. It's easy to use. Um, I do have a, a quick question for you about it, though, Scott. Yep. Uh, what was the fuel economy in it like? Yeah, it depends on how you're driving. So I did a sort of 90 minute highway loop that I do with some of the cars we test and I came back at like six, six and a half litres per 100 k's. And we've seen that with the Civic as well. If you're cruising on the highway, those Honda engines are incredibly efficient. 
in the city, less so. So the combined figure that I got was about 8.5 litres per 100 k's. It's not terrible by the standards of an SUV that size, but the fact it doesn't have start-stop is really disappointing because so much of that consumption was just idling at the traffic lights around our office. And if the car turned itself off when you did that, you would obviously not be using fuel and you'd get a much better number. Mm. And the other question I have for you uh, is, did you sit in the second row by any chance? I did. So we've, again, talked about this, but the second row in the last Civic was a bit disappointing. See me. Sorry, the last <laughs> CRV, excuse me. <laughs> the second um, row of the Civic is fantastic. Yes. Just <laughs> um, it has these doors that open to 90 degrees, which is great. It has plenty of leg room, but the old CRV with a sunroof had shocking headroom. Especially with seven seats, because they were on rails, so they were raised up yeah, as well. Yeah, they'd lift up. And so you'd sit there and like, I couldn't sit up straight. I had to tilt my head and James's hair would get ruined by the, the bump behind Heaven the sunroof. Forbid. Disaster. Yes. Um, this new one is better again. So it's got more leg room, uh, it's got headroom even if you do have a sunroof fitted. I can sit back there comfortably. And it's still got the clever stuff that makes it a great car if you're a parent. So it, are they magic seats? Just, just uh, to sort of jump ahead no, there? No, they're, not. they're, they're not. not. They're bloody close to it though. They're very impressive. Yeah, they, the they, they fold work. properly flat, which is not a given with these SUVs. Um, and I'm a little bit disappointed. The seven seat model with the seven the sixth and seventh seat in there, there's like a bump in the boot floor that means you have to put a little divider in to flatten it. Mm. But that only is because the floor is so low in five seat models and it frees up so much space. So it's kind of a give and take there. It is a very, very practical car. And I think if I had to carry around my own children, which I don't have, but I'm assuming they're tall because I'm tall, the CRV would be a really great car for it because there's room for them to grow as they get to teenagers and that sort of thing in a way there's not in a CX-5 necessarily or a Tiguan, something like that. It is a big car. Yeah, it's a really big car. So um, we do actually have a full video review. Paul's done it. It's uh, on the YouTube channel now, so click up there and we'll put a link in the description. Uh, but guys, the important question, buy or pass? I'll let you start this one. <laughs> <laughs> I think there, it, it may depend on the variant. I think there are certain ones in the range that don't, aren't quite as compelling as others. I think the, the seven seaters, um, like the one that you drove, is a really great one because in that segment, there's only really two other competitors that offer that. And I should note, the one we have was only front wheel drive. And I, I, they I, don't I, do an all wheel drive seven seater. Oh, is it only the five seater? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. there's okay. only one, there's two all wheel drive models and they're both five seat petrols. Yeah. Um, which I don't necessarily think is, is really, the, of really the ones to buy because they add quite a bit of money for not a huge amount of gain. I think um, the base seven seat is really good. The L seven seat is actually pretty good as well given the price and the amount of features you get or the top spec hybrid, they're all like buy. And I think particularly the hybrid as well, when you start looking at where everything's priced these days, it's actually really competitive. What's the hybrid cost? It's 59,900 drive away. So it's a fair lick cheaper than a uh, Outlander plug-in hybrid or um, what And else you're is still there? undercutting a top spec RAV4 hybrid when you yeah. factor in the on-road costs. You'll probably get one sooner too. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that as well. Yeah. Um, what I'm, are you, Scott? Bypass. I'm buying. Yep. Uh, I, I like the last CRV, even though it was old, and I think this one just builds on those strengths. Um, I'm kind of with James. I think it offers really good value at the bottom end and really good value at the very top end, and some of the stuff in the middle is a little bit confused. So I'll take mine in red as a hybrid, please. Fair enough. Well, one of, yeah, one of the more pleasant surprises of this year, I think, mm. it's... Um, yeah, generally an all-round fairly good car. And I think if you're an average punter, it's probably going to fit the bill for you really well. Uh, but we're going to move on. Uh, we're going to leave all of our Japan stuff behind now. Well, I think I don't know uh, what their picks are, but we're going to move on to our picks of the week. And I'm going to ask if I can go first, and can I please talk about race cars for a second? Yes and yes. Okay. <laughs> really exciting news came out last week that we're finally going to have a full-blown GT4 category in Australia, which... If you don't know what GT4 is, it's essentially improved, improved production cars. So basically, yeah. think M3, BMW M3s, uh, Mercedes AMG GTs, Porsche Caymans with roll cages and a bit of a tune, and they all go racing in a category. But they all have what's called balance of performance. So essentially, they all meet the same top speed, aero requirements, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a lot of it comes down to setup. So we're going to have that in Australia from next year as part of the Shannon Speed Series, and I cannot wait because that is <laughs> gt4 is such a great category you're gonna have uh, i think a really good mix of races and a really good mix of cars so i look forward to seeing that um and hopefully we see like a really really cool variety of exotic cars it's not just a bunch of old commodores racing around the great thing about gt4 is that it's not affordable because you still need to pay call it a quarter of a million dollars for one of these you cars you have to buy a road car and then add all the bits well to no it. so most of the car makers will now sell you a gt4 car through ford their factory program the don't they so yeah. ford porsche audi for a long time with the rs3 
uh, BMW with the M4 or the M2, one of the two, you can actually buy a GT4 car from BMW Motorsports. You can import it, and obviously it's a track car, you're not registering it, so it doesn't need to be right-hand drive. And they will then sell you the parts to support it. You can use them to help you get it all set up. As motorsport goes, if you want to be serious about it, it's definitely the, the most affordable sort of step on that ladder before you get to serious GT3 and Le Mans racing. I think, and I was discussing this with Igor before about who the kind of people that would be racing it is. And it's, it's a really cool mid-step from sort of your open wheel of Formula yeah. Ford to getting into like, if you're going for supercars, the Super 3 categories or Carrera Cup, it's just a, yeah, like I said, slightly more affordable uh, than In the going. context of racing, yeah. Absolutely, but um, yeah, look, money is a, a different level in racing. <laughs> uh, James, we're gonna throw it over to you. What is your pick of the week, mate? Um, so it's a very quick one. I, me and Jade were scouring the internet one day for viral stories and we found this um, old lady who knits sweaters for supercars and it's really <laughs> funny. Yeah, she like knits or crochets like sweaters and they, they go almost like car covers and they perfectly fit everything. And there's like pictures on the internet of like oh. G-Wagons, v Veyron and they've Crochet my ride. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it was really cute. I so, thought that was fun. That's yeah. So it matches your greyhound. <laughs> <It's all laughs> the miniature ones, though, yeah, not yeah. the big ones. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, Scott, what's yours this week? Uh, I've gone a little left field this week. Usually, I bring something from Instagram or motorsport, but I've actually uh, I've got Jimmy Kimmel. Um, oh, that's, yeah, he okay. popped up on my one of the social feeds, doing a bit on his show with Olivia Rodrigo, carpool karaoke style. But the car caught my eye. Because usually, and I know you do the same thing, when I see a shot from inside a car, I look and I go, because of that door handle, I can tell you that it's a Range Rover or whatever. We're just nerds. And I was looking at this thing going, what the hell is that? I cannot work it out. Does anyone want to guess what Jimmy Kimmel was driving? Well, I just want to start by saying, when you brought this up earlier in the office, I thought you said Jimmy Fallon. And so I take back everything I said because I quite like Kimmel. Okay. <laughs> I don't like Fallon. Uh, I'm going to guess... It was something that may have had some testing and development done in Australia. Yeah, but it wasn't a Commodore, it was a VinFast. Yes, which is uh, like a Commodore, but worse in every single way. Well, more Vietnamese, less Australian. Um, but yeah, we've been trying to get in touch with VinFast for ages, because they bought the Lang Lang Proving Ground that we used to film. They had a head office set up in Australia. Um, and then they just decided, actually, we're not doing that. We're going to the US now. They sort of, they left the country so quickly, they never put the signs down from the yes. office. <laughs> so, Jimmy Kimmel, if you're watching, call me. Tell me who you spoke to at VinFast. I want to interview them for a story. Olivia Rodrigo, if you're watching, just call me. Um, so, yes, Scott's in trouble now. <laughs> uh, we might not see him for a couple of weeks, as he'll be in the doghouse. <laughs> Uh, but that pretty much wraps us up uh, for the week. Um, James, did you have a good time? I did, yeah. Hopefully I don't get um, dragged in the comments for being too slow off the line like I was a couple of weeks ago. Well, <laughs> I read them. Yes, <laughs> yes, James took part in a recent drag race and... Um, he did it on Perth time. Yes, yes. yes. Look, I'm not an intern, just so anyone's wondering, just in case anyone's wondering. <laughs> to be fair, in the words of Meatloaf, two out of three ain't bad, and that's the amount of races you did not actually meatloaf. win. So, <laughs> um, 70s Meatloaf, it's all good. Uh, guys, any final thoughts before we wrap up? <laughs> no, I've got nothing on the back of Meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, um, Scott's still reliving the pain from that AFL grand final, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, 10 years ago now, something like that. Yeah, it still burns. Mm, so it still absolutely. Burns. All right, well, guys, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, uh, if you did enjoy the podcast please leave us a comment or a rating or a review on whatever podcast platform you're listening uh, and did you enjoy james leave us a comment we'd like to know we need to know whether we uh, uh keep him or get rid of him it's very important your feedback if you do have any questions for us write to us podcast at carexpert.com.au but until next week see you later